Redstone clocks are essential. So essential, in fact, that they are in almost every single redstone machine that I design, from automatic farms to the escape rooms that I like to build. They're so important that nearly every single redstone builder in the world uses them to some degree or another. For example, for the intro of this video, I took a look at some of the world downloads of Hermitcraft and found redstone clock after redstone clock, example after example. So in today's video, let's dive into some examples of redstone clocks, where they come from, and how we can use them in our builds today. All right, let's start out by talking about what redstone clocks actually are. Despite what you may think, redstone clocks don't tell the time of day like a Minecraft clock or a real life clock would. A redstone clock is a circuit that produces a periodic power signal, like so. We have different designs to produce fast signals, and we have different designs to produce slow signals, all utilizing different redstone components in the game. I think it would be fitting to start where redstone clocks started in the first place, in the alpha version of Minecraft in 2010. This design is commonly referred to as the oldest clock design in Minecraft, utilizing only three components, dust, solid blocks, and torches. Each section of the design is hooked to the next. So when we give this a little kickstart, you can see that the signal kind of goes around and around, each section powering the next one in line. We can take an output from any point in the circuit, and you, as you can see, that will give us our redstone clock output. In 2011, the torch-based designs were vastly replaced by repeater-based designs because that's the year that the repeater was introduced. It also vastly decreased the footprint of redstone clocks. This design still remains one of the slimmest redstone clock designs in the game. Essentially, what's happening is the signal is being passed back and forth between these repeaters, being passed through the redstone dust here, as you can see. We can take our output from one of these redstone dusts and have a very consistent and reliable redstone clock output. However, this design does need to be manually kickstarted. This is an easy way to do that, just with a torch and a block like that. So if you don't want to bother with that, you can always build this automatic design which, with a flick of the lever, kickstarts the system and allows it to continue to loop around with the piston and torch doing those two things respectively. Our designs up to this point have either included mainly a torch or mainly the repeaters. But these next couple of designs utilize both the torch and the repeater at the same time. For example, in this simple design, we have this torch, which when powered, the system turns off. But when depowered, this torch sends a signal through this repeater, through the block, that goes to our output, but it also turns left and goes back and depowers our torch here, allowing us a very easy and simple way to loop the signal around. One thing to know about this design though, and designs utilizing the redstone torch in general, is that if the redstone torch is powered and depowered too fast, too often, it will burn out like so. It will take a minute for it to reignite itself. Usually it needs a block update like this, but sometimes it just needs to time out and it'll kickstart itself back up. Redstone torches are advantageous to use if you need a long and slow redstone clock output. For example, this second design is a logical extension of the first design, but it utilizes many more repeaters, as you can tell. This is advantageous because repeaters can be customized in their timing, either by adding more repeaters or just simply by adjusting the tick delay on each repeater. So if you need a long and slow output, this clock is a great design. Two years after the repeater was introduced, we received the comparator which allowed us to make an even slimmer design of the redstone clock from before. This design works as follows. When we turn on this lever, a signal strength of 15 goes through the comparator. That signal strength travels through this redstone dust going 15, 14, 13. A signal strength of 13 is then inputted to the side of this comparator. Because the comparator is set to subtract mode, it subtracts 15 from 13, outputting 2. That signal strength of 2 is not able to reach the side of the comparator, allowing the signal strength of 15 to be outputted again. And that repeats itself over and over and over super duper fast like this. Now, this speed of repetition is unusable in most cases. For example, if we go over here, this is the same design, just putting a block here. This repeater isn't able to turn off and on fast enough, so it just thinks it's constantly powered. However, if we utilize a repeater like so, we could then transform that signal into something more usable. Just a bonus side note on this topic, this is how most auto dispensers work or, or auto droppers work. We're utilizing the same mechanic using the repeater and subtract mode, sending the signal through the block. Well, first of all, it goes and empowers the dispenser by quasi-connectivity here, more on that in a future video. But it also sends the signal around this corner through this block and into this comparator, which sends the signal back into 
the comparator allowing it to flash on and off very quickly. So whenever there is, whenever the comparator detects items in the container here, it will send a pulse powering the dispenser, allowing it to, to automatically drop all of its items. By far the most popular type of redstone clock is the hopper clock. Let's start with this simple design. When depowered, an item is transferred back and forth between these two hoppers, and this comparator is able to read whenever the item is in this right hopper, giving the output accordingly. So what if we take, instead of using a lever, we take a redstone block and move that back and forth, allowing either one or the other hopper to be powered at all times. This allows us to put more than one item in the hopper system at once, because all of the items will transfer before moving back to the other side. So when all these are done, we can move the block back and then they'll start transferring back to the other side, allowing our comparator to read that output. Another advantageous feature of the redstone block is that it's able to be moved by pistons, further automating this design. Now, what if we took this automation even further? This is the world famous Etho hopper clock. Just like before, we have a certain number of items being transferred back and forth between these two hoppers. These comparators are reading the quantity of these hoppers and giving an output accordingly. That allows the sticky pistons to transfer the redstone block back and forth, allowing all the items to move from one hopper to another before starting to move in the other direction. This is useful because we can put as many items as we want in the hopper clock to customize our output timing. And that's what makes the Etho hopper clock one of the most used and famous redstone clocks in the game. Just a quick side note, the Etho hopper clock was named after the man who designed it from a YouTube channel called Ethos Lab. I highly recommend you go check it out. He's been one of the most influential players of Minecraft in its history and stuff like that is just good to know. With that quick side note out of the way, you might be wondering, now how do you take an output from the Etho hopper clock? Well, that's an excellent question. There's two, there's generally two ways. First of which is you can use a comparator on one or both of the hoppers that will deactivate temporarily when all of the items are out of the system. For example, like that, you just saw it flash right there. But I think the more popular way is to take two repeater outputs from both of the rest of the block positions, because when it switches, both of the repeaters will be temporarily deactivated, allowing you to take an output from that. One more thing about this before moving on, this is the Etho Hopper Clock's flat variant. In case you saw this in the background and were interested, this is the same exact thing except the pistons are to the side of the hoppers instead of on top of them. All right, let's take a look at something completely different, the item despawn clock. So an item in Minecraft has a five minute timer before despawning. So we can take a wooden pressure plate to measure whenever there's an item floating above it. Attached to the block is a redstone torch. So whenever this item despawns, let's see if we can pick it up to simulate, that pink wool will activate just for a second. As you can see, we can send that to our output, to our machine or whatever. And we can also recycle that output to dispense another item onto the pressure plate. When observers came along to the game, they revolutionized redstone clocks because they detect block updates in the block on its face side and output a redstone signal on its backside. So we can take this concept and just wrap the signal around and every time it activates, it changes this redstone in front of it and we get a very continuous and fast redstone clock. This leads us to the smallest redstone clock design in all of Minecraft, clocking in at just two blocks total. Essentially what's happening is each observer is detecting the other observer detecting it, and it just transfers that signal back and forth. And this is very popular because the observer can be moved with pistons to be utilized automatically. However, you might notice that this signal is going much faster than our manually placed one. And that's because the sticky piston variant actually is trading two signals back and forth as opposed to just one. When I placed it manually, the only thing that's happening is this observer is detecting the fact that I placed the block. However, when you push it in with a piston, this observer also fires. So there's two signals going back and forth between these two observers, making it twice as fast. So that's a little fun fact about these observer-based clock designs. One final observer-based clock design to mention is instead of having them face each other, 
we have a bunch of them all facing in a circle. So when we move a redstone component to complete the circle, we have the signal going around and around. And we can take an output from this particular observer, in this case, to only fire occasionally when the signal reaches this corner. Now, in this case, I'm using a rail because if I were to use another observer, we'd actually get two signals going around like we did earlier. One from the observer being moved and one from the observer observing the one being moved. So that sends two signals through the circle and is ultimately why I prefer to use rails just for consistency sake. So every design that we've gone over so far has been reliable, it's been consistent, and it's been predictable. However, sometimes you want something a little less predictable, random, if you will. And these last few designs are completely random redstone clock designs, starting with our redstone ore and armor stand randomizer. So by default, you might know that redstone ore looks like this. However, when an entity walks on it, it lights up like so. So we can utilize this mechanic by placing an armor stand and every time the redstone ore attempts to de-light itself looking like this this observer will detect that but it'll also immediately relight itself because there's an entity on it technically because this armor stand counts as an entity so this timer is average about 68 seconds with large fluctuations in my limited testing i noticed sometimes it was as soon as three seconds to up to 12 or even 20 minutes so, oh, there was, there was one right there. It happened real quick. Another slightly cheaper alternative to this design would be to use a sapling instead of a redstone ore. You could set it up just like this, make sure to put a block over the sapling so it doesn't grow into a tree. Every time the sapling attempts to grow, the observer will detect that. And it also just so happens to be the exact same timings as the redstone ore, about every 68 seconds, but with large fluctuations. So this is another cheaper design of the exact same timings. Moving on to the cactus design. Every time the cactus grows, the observer will detect that. It will also break the newly formed cactus, allowing it to be infinitely repeatable. And the cactus grows about every 18 minutes. So if you need something that's a little bit more spaced out than the sapling or armor stand design, consider using a cactus. This one's another pretty easy and simple one. Essentially, we just have a chicken trapped in a cage and one pressure plate on one block. Um, Every time the chicken runs over the pressure plate, it activates our system. If you want a more frequent activation, you can always trap him in more. Oh, but don't let him escape like that. Well, now we'll never get a random output. Moving swiftly on to our last design of the video. This is a hybrid between one of our earlier designs of the observer-based designs and a randomizer circuit, in which I'll talk more about in a future video. But essentially, we just have a bunch of stackable items and one non-stackable item. Whenever the non-stackable item is selected at random, we get a signal strength of three, which reaches our lamp in this case. We could have a repeater placed here to send our signal out to our output. But as long as there's three redstone dust away from it and a disproportionate amount of stackable items versus non-stackable items, you're guaranteed to get a random output. So that'll do it for our redstone clock installment of this series. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, I know this is a dense topic, but if you have any questions, feel free to let me know in the comments. I'll do my best to help you out as needed. And again, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one. See ya.